everybody. Welcome to the Sex with Sophie podcast. I am your host, Sophie. Today, we have an amazing, phenomenal person named Pamela who's joining us to talk about asexuality. Honestly, it's a topic that I am very lay on. And so I'm very excited to, to learn from her. As usual, she is an individual. She's a person. She does not represent the, the entire compendium of what it means to be asexual. We're here to try to learn about what it is from her lived experience, what her world is like, not necessarily as a representative of this, but just somebody who can help us shed some light on what this label entails. And so everybody, welcome Pamela. Hello, everybody. Hello, Sophie. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Thanks for taking the time to do this. And the thing about Pamela, you guys, is that she is an intensely private person. So I am thrilled that she trusts me enough to have this conversation. Thank you so, so very much. Um, and just for our viewing audience at home, Pamela is a beautiful Asian American woman uh, or cis presenting woman <laughs> who is uh, always flashing like the best glasses ever. She's like my Zenny twin. So we always have um, really fun frames and hers today are a beautiful light teal, like a kind of a jade, light jade color, gorgeous. And um, she's got long, straight, pretty black hair and um, just the most angelic and beautiful continents. I, I love her to pieces. So I'm really glad to have her here. <laughs> And so um, I, I would like to ask you, uh, just first off, how is it that you even know me? Well, we met at work, although we had very little overlap. And then after we both left that organization, then you and I connected and got to know each other much better. So it was a work connection, but the, the relationship friendship happened after. It did. It did. It really blossomed. Um, mm -hmm. And I really appreciate her for for everything that we kind of went through with all that. Um, so I, it's funny because I think we started by kind of trauma bonding a little bit with that, but then I, we just really became like such good friends. So she's just such a good person. Um, so tell us, what are your pronouns? Where are you? What do you do? Uh, so I actually, my pronouns are she, they, and where am I? I'm in Southern California, Orange County specifically. And what do I do? I always have such a hard time answering that question. I do my best to stay out of trouble, uh, but <laughs> constantly find myself in it, regardless of the actions of work or just interactions that just happen. So I think that's okay. the best definition of what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, okay. We're here to talk about asexuality. That is one of the LGBTQIA plus acronyms. It's the A. Um, which could stand for asexual or aromantic. I've even see, seen the agender. Um, but could you tell us what asexuality means? What's the broad definition? And then maybe even more specifically, what does that mean to you? Sure. So I think in just the strictest sense, it's not being attracted to somebody sexually or not wanting to act upon anyone in a sexual way. So any of the connections or attractions I have for people are definitely not based on something physical or me wanting to do something physical with them. Um, I'm really glad you talked about the A and what it can stand for because a lot of times I've heard that people think it stands for ally. And, oh, and so to me, part of the thing around the erasure of asexuality in some sense, it's like it's almost um, dismissed because it just is so antithetical to how most people uh, think that sexuality or interactions with humans as we grow and become adults, how they must be. When I hear asexuality, it's an orientation, a sexual orientation. So how does that differ then from something like celibacy? Right. So like a sexual orientation is intrinsic to who I am as an identity, right? It's not a choice. If we think about sexual orientation, where celibacy is specific choice to be going through abstinence. It might be that, that a celibate person still has sexual tendencies and are suppressing them or not acting on them. Whereas asexuality to me is that that's not a thing. It's not on the radar as a way of engaging, at least on my end of the spectrum, because I know asexuality could be a little wider than that. And if you want, I can talk a little bit about what that could be. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Demisexuals, for example, are uh, maybe asexual, except when they feel an emotional bond towards somebody. So in that way, they will engage in a sexual relationship there, but may otherwise be thinking of themselves as asexual. And then to me, that's kind of the bigger thing around the world is that allosexuals are basically people that are sexually 
attracted to other folks. There's this conflation of sex and romanticism, right? So it's like those are two things are together. Whereas for people on who are ace, which is like the nickname for asexuals, would say that that isn't necessarily a thing. Aromantic means I'm not necessarily romantically inclined to somebody. Asexual means that I'm not necessarily wanting to engage with someone sexually. Um, but those two things don't have to be the same. So an asexual could want to have a romantic relationship. It's just not sexual based. But if they're demisexual, then it could have a sexual connection, but that's only because of an emotional bond. So it's this thing around really unpacking some of the ways that I feel like most folks in life don't realize that we have put together as one and the same when they actually have the separation. It just isn't Mm -hmm. how it manifests for most folks. And and it's funny because I don't know, I'm not a man, so I can't speak for, for men, but as a woman, demisexual actually sounds very much like what I think women experience. Like I, it's very rare for me to be like, oh, that's celebrity. You know, ever since I was like into Backstreet Boys back in the day, (laughs) like like after that, like I've never really had this like, oh, wow, shit out of here. Like I've never had that about (laughs) many (laughs) celebrities or people that I've come across. So it, it, it has been that I've had to really form a strong emotional relationship with someone before feeling like I would want to take it there sexually. So I'm wondering if, if you know, I'd, I'd be curious to know about how gender impacts asexuality, demisexuality. And I, I actually really like that distinction that you're making between aromanticism versus asexuality, because I, I'm not sure how to live in that skin to understand it. Like, so do you feel that you're asexual and aromantic or simply mm-hmm. asexual? No, I'm both. I'm, I feel like I'm on the extreme end. It's just like, no, none of that. <laughs> and, and I want to be clear. <laughs> and I want to be clear. That doesn't mean I can't have a strong connection with a person, right? It's just not in that way. And, and so that's where this whole thing around um, I'm at a normativity. Sometimes it's called a mato normativity. It's this mm. phrase that was coined by Elizabeth Brake. And so she said that there's the assumption that all humans want to pursue love and or romance and be in a monogamous long-term relationship, which if you think about it kind of dictates like the world at large, at least in America of how we, how we engage um, Mm -hmm. and in other maybe European countries. But I would say that, that the thing is that you're supposed to be married and or partnered. So anybody who is single is somehow lonely or looked down upon or excluded because they are not part of a couple. And so with mm-hmm. that, I name that because there's this thing around if that's part of the the spectrum of how things work, it's like, well, why aren't you dating? Why aren't you married? At least go hook up with somebody. There's this thing about it has to be a romantic or kind of a partnership that is prioritized over any other type of relationship. And to mm-hmm. me, that's kind of this unspoken social norm that's been accepted and not interrogated. So that's where mm-hmm. this, this uh, we don't have these conversations to me then around hey, those all don't have to coexist. And why are you prioritizing your romantic relationship? I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just that is the assumption. That's what is done. So if I'm, you know, like, you know, they have the bros over hoes kind of thing, right? Like, it's like, they (laughs) they say that, but it's still as soon as somebody gets in partnership, it's like, no, that's not really a thing. Right? So it's like, so we joke about it. But really, in the end, it's the partner that ends up prioritizing over a lot of other things. Interesting. So, so speaking of loneliness, do you ever feel loneliness? And and if, and if so, then what? In what way? Like, is it like a longing for company or or a relationship of like a friendship type sort, or 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 do you just not feel lonely at all? I think the loneliness I feel is being in a place or with people that don't want to understand where I'm coming from. So I don't, I'm somebody who's authentic and I don't pretend, I don't try to create, yeah, are. <laughs> I don't try to create, very <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, <laughs> so um, I don't look. try, <laughs> so we're going to talk, laugh about this forever. Like, Sorry. I don't try to be contrary or to be in people's faces, but also like, if I want to exist in my truth, which I feel like all of us need to be better at doing versus being yep. this fake accepted I feel the most lonely where I'm like, I can't say anything because I'm not going to be heard, seen or understood. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to keep putting myself in the situation where that's going to be a a thing. So I'd rather be by myself where I know my I know how to self entertain, whether it be like 
through reading or other stuff, but I can be very fulfilled without the BS of social norms that I just am like, I- I'm, I'm not into it. I'm not going to play it. And if you all can't see that you're playing it, we're not going to get along. So yeah, I just, that's where yeah. I feel the loneliness. And so I feel like it's almost like I've over the years become more reclusive because I'm just like, I'm just tired of playing. Oh, wow. Well, I, I gotta ask you, like, do you feel like if more people understood asexuality or that, again, it's not a proclivity, it's, it's intrinsic to you? Or, or what is it that you wish everyone knew about hmm. being ace or being arrow that might help ease that for you, where it's not that you have to walk into the conversation and explain or teach or educate in order to then start from square one with someone. What what should we all walk away with as a as a base point of understanding about this? I think there's a sense of empowerment of just owning what's true for us in general, right? Whether regardless of what aspect of our identity we're talking about, and just honoring that versus assuming that. Um, and you know, when I talked about defining asexuality, I know some people say it's like a lack of sexual sexual desire. And I'm like, lack of already puts in a deficit model. So it's not mm. like I'm broken, or I have something that is missing, or that me being by myself is a problem. Right. But all mm. of those things, if we are assuming that is the norm, that's how it's supposed to be, then everything about me is an affront to what is supposed to be the normal part of everyday life. And so Mm -hmm. I just wish folks could say that if I'm making not a choice, but like these are how I operate in the world, I'm a person, accept me as me, not put on these Mm -hmm. other things that they or you want, because you've been told this is what is supposed to happen. And I would say that about any normal, right? Yeah, like what is normal, right? That's, has it ever like when I said earlier, has it ever been interrogated? I would say no, it's just assumed to be true. And I think that's a big problem, especially as we become more divisive in the world where we are becoming much more narrow in terms of like what we take on as information, like it becomes this harder thing for us to really like open up and listen and see one another in new ways that have value and are valid versus, oh, here's another thing I have to learn. It's just about, hey, for years, we've been discounting folks' existence because it was just too fringe, too much, too whatever, not important. And I'm like, just have value for someone as a human, humanize them, see them for who they are and not put your expectations on them. It's not for you, yeah. like honor the person. You know, I, I love that because, I, you know, just looking at our friendship, like, I feel like our conversations, <laughs> like we talk about birds and, and disability and like DEI, like, I feel like you and I talk about so many other things. And there's, we have this whole world of conversation and connection that has nothing to do with like me talking about my husband with you or, or asking you what date you went on or whatever. Like it's, so I agree with that very much because just in our interaction, I've seen how just accepting you for who you are and like t- almost carving out the sexual romantic relationship aspect of what most people tend to normally try to, to talk about as a point of connection opens this wide world of other things to talk about with us. But honestly, like what led you to discovering your asexuality? Because it being an orientation in my head, I'm likening it to a a person who's homosexual discovering, oh, wow, I actually like women or I actually like men or, or what was that moment for you? Or was it like that? Yeah, I would say that my default has been, oh, if it's different than everyone else. I must be wrong. There's something wrong Mm. with me. So, I mean, even as a kid, people would say like, oh, that person's hot, even though they didn't understand in third grade. It's like somebody was attractive (laughs) or I I don't even remember the terms like this feels so antiquated, but like, oh, he's a fox or whatever. It was just bizarre (laughs) to me. And I'd be like, okay, I guess he's good looking, but he's kind of a jerk. So I don't care. (laughs) And so for me, it was more about the person and their personality and their behavior, Mm -hmm. how they interacted versus this thing around looks. And I grew up mm. in Orange County, LA. So which is like the hot spot of oh, yeah. like, look good. <laughs> and I go, I don't care. Like, what? why is this? But then I would still shame myself for not being more attractive or all of these other things. So for me, from a very young age, it was not getting it and then feeling like, oh, maybe I went through puberty later because everybody else is talking about dating or, you know, doing all this stuff. I'm like, I don't, I still don't get it. And so it mm-hmm. just felt like there's something wrong with me because I don't get it. And yet I would still have close relationships with other people and be 
if I'm going to use the word attracted to somebody, but it was really about them as a person. What was the light that was shining from within that made me go like, that person is so cool. I want to know them. And it was nothing about anything but like who they are at the core. And that feels very young. Like, I feel like we discover that at a young age and we somehow lose it when we prioritize sex and, and romance. Right? Like, mm-hmm. where, where is that thing around loving a person for the person versus this other stuff? And, mm-hmm. and that's where I feel like when I got the term and I started learning about what it was, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've always been that. I just didn't have a name for it. But I felt like I was wrong the entire time because nobody oh, else wow. was like me. You know, it's wow. like, let's always talk about what are you doing? Who are you dating? And, and making fun of people who were sexually naive or didn't have stuff. It's like, you know, making fun of virgins. All of this stuff is like part of the social norm and the fabric of how we operate. And it's like, mm-hmm. so there's such this priority on like how you have to be not just hot, but like with somebody and sexually experienced, but for maybe for women, not too much. And it's like, what? I don't, I'm out of that whole game. <laughs> oh, like, wow. 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 Nope. <laughs> so, so. How old were you when you actually were like, I'm Ace and this is me and, and wow, it, it clicks. Like, were you in your teens or were you actually kind of more into your adult life or, or when did it start to gel for you? I don't think I had a term till much later in life. So I think as mm-hmm. an, a way of operating through the world, I don't think anything's really changed. It was just more later on as asexuality became uh, more visible that I'm like, oh, that's me, right? So I had a, mm-hmm. I had a term, I could name it, I could actually articulate it, whereas before it wasn't conscious. It was just, this is how I feel. And mm-hmm. it couldn't be discussed because it wasn't understood at large. I also think it's really funny is that I must give off ace vibes because it's not like I was ever <laughs> hit on or, or anything throughout my life. Like I've just oh had God. basically zero attention in that front. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that is that too. crazy to me because you are gorgeous. Like you're so beautiful. Oh, like I genuinely you. You, like, <laughs> wow. Like I mean, that surprises me, especially being in LA. It's like, cause, cause you, I don't know, you fit that pretty mold. Like it's, it's really? that's wow. unusual to me. Yeah. You're so pretty. Like you're just, oh. Thank you. You're beautiful. Like I can't. So I, if you're if you're listening to this and not watching it, you might want to go check out her. Bio no, picture. don't look. I mean, she's so look pretty. pretty. <laughs> so so I don't know. Like I assume like you were over here like batting people off with, <laughs> you know, the ten foot pole or something. But you feel like no. genuinely like it's. Do you, now do you think that it's pe- people aren't chatting you up or aren't talking to you or that you just don't have the tools to recognize when people are interested in you in that way yeah so people would joke with me and go like oh yeah that person was flirting with you. you don't get it i'm like no i think i would know i'm not that i feel like i know how to read people um uh-huh. so i actually uh because i'm also I, I didn't talk about this earlier but i i am kind of more of a scientist so i do research and things like that so i've actually interviewed people that i know to go like what is wrong with me why would you never ask me out or think i was attractive and and most people would say you would fuck me up. And I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's conflated with my asexuality wow. where I guess I just come up, I come off strong. Wow. So it's just like, I'm not going to do bullshit. Right. See, I and know. I go, I okay. Like the woman, I feel like that's the strong, independent woman in you. I'd, I feel like that's something even as a, just a black woman. Like, I don't think I'm very intimidating, but apparently black women are intimidating. And so like, I think that's, maybe the misogyny of what people are experiencing around you. But I don't know. That's, that's interesting. I'm, I'm glad that you don't have to contend with that. I feel like that would be unfair for somebody who's asexual to have to contend with that. So I, I'm, you know, I'm glad that that's the case for you, but at the same time, I, I hate that. I think it does probably come more from a misogynistic place and than that you are exuding these, you know, unapproachable vibes or something. Cause that is not the case. <laughs> In any oh, way, shape, or form. You. This bitch is hilarious, first of all. <laughs> You're so funny. It is, oh, <laughs> I'm telling you, like, she's just like, I don't know. You, to me, like, I feel your magnetism. I feel Aww. like a desire to have a connection with you. I could never see you as unapproachable. So, like, you know, but I do get that you are very, like, adamant. You're very smart. You're super intelligent. This bitch is a fucking genius, y'all. Like, she's like, this research PhD queen, like she does speaking events. She's amazing. 
So I could see how that, again, could be like an intimidation factor. But no, I think just your personality in general. No, you're you're amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. <laughs> no, seriously. Well, Oh, I appreciate yeah, it. But like, what's so interesting to me, though, is like, as an Asian who, you know, like the stereotype mm -hmm. is that Asian women are fetishized and all of this other stuff, like that has not mm -hmm. been my experience at all. And it's so interesting to be like, here's another aspect of my identity that doesn't even cut into the ace part. Like, where does that um, right. intersect at all? And and so maybe this is um, evidence of where I'm unapproachable. But I was, um, I do some acting sometimes and I was doing some background work and was uh, partnered with this other woman. And so we were just kind of chatting it up and she's a younger Asian female, very attractive, but also just a cool human. And this guy came over and he starts just being mean to her. And I'm so out of the world of like negging and what all this is, right? So I don't realize that's what's oh, happening, but I'm just God. watching it going like, what are you doing? And I actually said that. <laughs> and he goes, what? I'm like, we're having a conversation. You are not invited. So like, go away. Like, she's not liking this. I'm not liking this. Goodbye. And right. then, um, so the woman was like, I didn't know you could do that. I'm like, well, I don't know. I couldn't do. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't like, well, I didn't know you couldn't younger. do that. I, I she was younger. I definitely, yeah, yeah. I had to grow into being like, oh, wow. I, I have agency. Like, I don't have to take her. Like, Yeah. That's stellar. Oh my God. Well, I didn't think it was a thing. I think it's funny that, so like, I didn't know that that had to be learned, right? It's just like, don't be me, like, stop, you know? And so for mm -hmm. me, like at that young age, it was about behavior. I don't care who you are. And then later on, he came and apologized to me. Oh, wow. And I'm like, don't talk to me, one. <laughs> and two, apologize to her. Right. 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 Like, I called you out, but it was about how you were treating her, which I didn't think sure. was okay. And then later on, he was checking everybody out at the end, you know, in terms of like, do we have your information for payment? And he mm -hmm. said to her, I have your address. Oh, that's and then she told, freaking creepy. Right? Oh. So she goes and she tells, I go, did he apologize to you? Because he was checking everyone out, like not checking them out, but you know, like literally. And, like, yeah. and she said, <laughs> yeah. And, then, and she goes, oh, he told me this. And I was like, oh, no, you know, and I was like, going to go over there and go like, oh, my you know God. what? I told you to apologize. And you said, what? Motherfucker. That's horrifying. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I understand that people experience. Right. But like, I don't have that kind of energy put at me. So mm -hmm. I don't even know like what it is like to fend that off. So like you said, what it, that's like, but like, if it comes in my space, even if it's not, at, it's not at, directed at me, but at somebody I just barely met. Like, mm -hmm. don't disrespect somebody. It's not okay. And right. so I will put these firm boundaries to go, I don't play this game. But it's funny because I don't pre-think about it. It's instinctual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I'm like, you're... oh, that probably wasn't okay. But I, <laughs> no, I think it's <laughs> instinctual because it's like solidly just who you are, you know? But like before that, but like before you came to grips with an understanding of what, you know, the label versus your actual experience was and how those lined up was this always the case like were you always capable of being like i just don't want this or what was your romantic relationship sexual journey like i'm saying in the before times but more so like in the before times of your like acceptance of your asexuality or your coming out of the closet of asexuality i mean nobody wanted this this was just like <laughs> Ugh, right so i don't oh think it God. became something that um since i wasn't feeling it inside it's not like i was throwing myself at people so if it wasn't coming at me i'm like I guess it's not a thing so so to mm -hmm. me that's part of the, the journey of my growing into myself going like am i that gross oh, like i am i that gross physically am i that gross as a human being you know like personality wise um oh, just like honey. am i not smart enough and Oh, I appreciate it. But I'm like, that's part of me trying to own where is my impact in the world and how do I become not just sexually viable or romantically viable, but like, what is it about me that I can work on myself to make mm -hmm. sure that I can have connections with people that are valid? And I just always felt like there was something intrinsically wrong. And again, that's because of this amount of normativity that we tend to live by that I must be wrong because I'm not seeking a partner. I'm not sitting there putting myself out there going like, hey, you know, I'm not on an app. But mm -hmm. uh, I think because most people have some kind of vibe they're putting out, 
I didn't know that was a thing. I just know mm-hmm. I wasn't, I guess I just wasn't doing it. And so of course it wasn't being read up on. Well, and let me ask you, like you said you have an ex-husband, like what is, do you, do you mind talking about your marriage or do you do not have to, we can just cut this, edit this out. Um, but if you would like to share, I'd love to know how that transpired or what happened there. Yeah. So it's funny cause I don't want to um, diminish him because he was probably the first person that actually showed true interest in me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was weird because how I connected with him honestly was at this really deep level because he is and was he's passed away. He's was oh, probably right. the biggest heart that I know. Like just cared so fucking much about connecting with people, loyalty, like all of that. And to me, that was just like, Oh my God, I get this. Like this to me is like, mm. yes, why can't we have this kind of thing around everyone? Not just about us as a couple, but just about people at large. And it was so not reciprocated. And so just to watch mm. his devastation of being let down, I'm like, I get it. But he would constantly put himself out there and be going out of his way. And I'm going like, honey, just stop. Like, you're putting more than they're giving you back. It's not reciprocal. Just stop it. So yeah. so to me, I think if we talk about demisexuality, like, I was so in love with him and still am so in love with him as a person that that emotional connection was like why we had sexual relations. Again, I wouldn't know this at the time, right? It was just more of like we were together and it wasn't an assumption that we're supposed to have sex. I mean, I guess it was, but it didn't, it felt different. Like I wanted to be with him mm-hmm. and it wasn't a question. But then when we divorced, um, <laughs> I remember saying, okay, I'm done forever. And oh, then wow. I would get this. Yeah. yeah. And then people were like, oh, you know, you're just, that was whatever. You're going to start dating again. I'll be <laughs> fine. You'll get married oh God, again. I think I would know. <laughs> and also oh, this, so this is where I am. I mean, you know me, right? But I'm like, just because you fucking told me what I'm going to do, I'm not going to do it just to prove you wrong. Exactly. That is you. I, I'll admit yep. it, that's you. Yep. I tried I will to be get this dead. woman a gift basket. I'm like, let me get you a gift uh, basket. No. Like, no, I don't want a gift basket. I'm like, well, I just want to get you some socks. Just some socks. No, I don't want Can I get you some tea? No, I don't want it. Don't get anything. I don't want She's so funny, y'all. She's like, I don't need nothing for nobody. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think it's that. I think she just genuinely. She doesn't want tea. She doesn't want socks. It's, that's fine. I respect that. No problem. No, but, but yeah. It's, she's, <laughs> <laughs> so it's so it's it's because like it's money that you're spending, right? And you care about me, which I love, and it's so sweet. But it's like we do this again, another social norm, like we're giving something because we want to be in service. And I'll be like, but if it's something that I'm not necessarily going to love as much as you are and giving it to me, it feels like money spent that doesn't need to be spent. So it's like very practical, but it's also breaking this thing around. Thank you so much, Sophie. I love it so much. And then me going like, there's the tea and the socks that I'm never going to throw away or give away. Because Sophie gave it to me. No, it's oh, not in the trash. It oh. would sit there because it's like, it's a gift from you. You know, like, and, and so, you know, when I die, people would be like, what's this tea <laughs> and socks, right? Because the stuff isn't going to disintegrate. But that would be what would happen. So I'm like, just our, our don't interaction. Don't go down that road. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But I think our interaction is just so much more fulfilling to me like this than any physical gift. So for me, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of like that to me, if we talk about love languages, um, Mm. I, I, it's so funny, but people love giving things and it's like, not that please. And I only say it to you because I feel like you can hear it. Most people can't. And so Mm. I just have to sit there and like pretend. And I, I'm like, why are, why are we playing this game? It's another game that I go like, stop the dumb games. (laughs) Wow. Well, okay. So how, how then does all of that, <laughs> the the whole essence and being of, of what Pamela is, the person who's very practical, very research oriented, very scientific, very smart, asexual, genuinely compassionate. <laughs> like how, where did all that come from? Like, what was it like being little Pamela? Like, what was your upbringing like? Like, do you feel like who you were as a child, how your family life was, did that impact these very strong beliefs that you hold now? 
I think so. Like, uh, so I have two younger sisters and the middle sister, her name is Julie, was born with Down syndrome and a lot of medical issues. So when she was born, the hospital was saying she might last a day, maybe a week. She had two holes in her heart. So she was basically purple and these crazy colors, apparently, in the first two years of her life before she actually had open heart surgery. And so it's just like my parents were constantly in this state of like, is she going to live or not? And my mom and my sister lived in the NICU for a long, long time. Like my mom was gone when my sister was born. And and so so to me, as I got two years old, I became this like, I've got to um, not save her, but like, I've got to be the good girl. And I've got to be the one to look out for her. I've got to protect her. And so even though I didn't understand that growing up, it was what do I do to keep her safe? And because she's got downs and she's physically different than others, people would stare at her or they'd make fun of her. And I'd be like, no, this isn't okay. And that was out mm. of a protectiveness as an older sister. But I think that became this thing at large. Not that I'm a savior, but I'm like, I'm going to be a spokesperson for people who can't speak for themselves, can't stand up for themselves, because we don't have enough folks that are championing that cause. So I didn't choose to be on the fringe or on the margins. It was just more of, me advocating for her from a very young age became part of who I am as a character. And then wow. my youngest sister, Sandy, she didn't have that same sense of protectiveness. She still cares. She still loves, but it's not the same as the older sister. Mm-hmm. And, and then of course I was protecting Sandy too. So for me, it was just kind of like this keep them safe kind of situation. Mm-hmm. And I think my parents were thankful for that because they were overwhelmed. You know, and, mm. and having somebody who was really resourceful and very stereotypical oldest sibling kind of things, being the the mm. one that, you know, is the third parent, but would step in and and be there in a way that maybe the other siblings wouldn't. That I feel mm. like had a very strong foundation in who I grew up to be. And then also I got bullied a lot as a kid. And so it was just, and no one stood up for me, which mm. was hard because who wants to be the, the person picked on? But if I saw someone picked on, I would put myself in the way. Oh, Not that wow. I could handle it better, but I was like, I can't watch somebody be ostracized. Like I would have been burned in Salem, like as a witch. <laughs> like, I would be like, <laughs> right? Just because like, I'm like, don't do that. Like, oh, oh no. she's a witch. She's contrary, boo. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> well, and, and it's funny. First of all, Julie is amazing. Like I've had the distinct pleasure being introduced to her and she is just a delight and i think primarily due to your influence on her like you're such a good sister to her and she's just so pleasant so happy i just adore her so so thank you for sharing her with me (laughs) but i could see that like i could absolutely see how having that sweet innocent little person who's gone through the things she's gone through and then that like activating like a sense of justice and like protection in you i could absolutely mm-hmm. see that because again that's very much who you are today so so that's cool thanks for putting those dots together for me but yeah, and, oh, so just really quickly so just clicked yeah. for me was that um so maybe that's part of why at a young age i cared about the person and how they behaved mm-hmm. and that became my attraction to people over anything else like that was so intrinsic to who i was that mm-hmm. i'm like I like this person because of what they did for my sister or what they Mm -hmm. are, who they are. And I always say that like who you are and what you do is everything to me. And, and Mm -hmm. so all of that other stuff was, I don't care. Who are you as a person? How are you going to treat my parents or my sisters? Like that's, or me, like that's what I care about. Hi, I'm Sophie, an author, wife, and mom on the hunt for real information about sex. If you're anything like me, then all you had to go on was your mom's mortifying birds and bees speech, your abstinence-laden middle school sex education curriculum, whatever it is they're showing on TV these days, and porn. Well, I'm anti-porn. Oh, no, not that I don't like porn, I love porn. What I'm saying is that I'm visually and aesthetically the polar opposite of what most people find desirable. Plus, I'm fat. Oh, don't feel sorry for me. I mean, who better to join on a journey of sexual learning and discovery than somebody that you can walk beside without distraction? That's why I'm building Sex with Sophie, to be a living set of courses that teach the primary acts and facets of sex based on the statistical analysis that I gather from my members' anonymized profiles and their answers to fun and interactive questionnaires. Plus, 
only members will be able to watch the Sex with Sophie show, which also premieres at launch. This is my supplementary documentary series, which covers everything from toes to toys, virginity to pregnancy, and kissing to kinks. Pre-enrollment for Sex with Sophie is open now. Sign up today and create your profile to become a Kickstarter for this endeavor with your funding, but also by helping us accrue data. Upon launch, you will get first look access to the courses and unlimited streaming to the Sex with Sophie show. But you don't have to wait until launch for the fun to begin. Pre-enroll today and you'll be regularly notified about fun questionnaires, new site features, and launch updates. You'll also get full access to exclusive content and extras from the Sex with Sophie podcast. This is where we interview people from different walks of sexual life like seniors, sex workers, BDSM, and lesbianism. Thank you for your interest in Sex with Sophie. Support us today by pre-enrolling at sexwithsophie.com on a plan that's comfortable for you. And remember, love one another with permission. Given the fact that you are Asian American, you're female presenting, you're asexual, <laughs> that's a lot of intersectionality, Pamela. <laughs> like how do those other components of you, how do they coincide with your asexuality? How does that, I don't know, it's hard to like, get out of the water you're swimming in to like reflect on it but if you were to, to try to do so like how do you feel your intersectionality or interact with your asexuality what, what's so interesting is that as i get older i'm hearing more people talk about how they're becoming invisible because they're no longer sexually mm. viable or that's how they've lived a lot of their identity i've never had that so i was like oh so i guess i have been invisible in a way that i didn't realize for years but it's like an oh, interesting wow. conversation to now talk about right like Wait, that's a thing? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Right. But again, I, it's not my lived experience. So it's this thing of, oh, that's been so much of their identity. It's It, it feels like they're, what they're going through now is what I was going through in a young age, which was nobody was interested in me. What does that mean about me? But I didn't have those years of living in that existence and not feel rejected. It was just, it was never part of my growing up. So I, I, it's... You know interesting now to have these conversations but it's different but it still has like some similar flavor mm -hmm. yeah no that's to me as a as a, a fat black woman <laughs> like, and, and it's funny because like i i used to be like so like hot stuff like in college like i was 140 pounds you know big old butt big old boobs and all you know so i went from being kind of a sexualized you know being i guess to then I got PCOS, I started to gain weight in my mm -hmm. early 20s. So I went from, you know, being in a very sexualized, fetishized, I guess, state to then um, having that invisibility. And we literally just had a podcast with a 70 year old man. And he mm -hmm. explained about how that was the hardest thing for him getting older was that that invisibility, that kind of that sexual invisibility in particular, that kind of creeps up on you as you get older. So I what you're saying to me is just so powerful because like what the fuck <laughs> how do we get how do we get over that like how do we then like tell the world like hey we're still people like we're still human beings we still have value just because i'm not you know that i know able to wear a bikini and, or pull that off as successfully as i used to or because i'm getting up in age or gaining weight or having a kid or whatever the things are that suddenly turn you into <laughs> Again, like you said, like an invisible person. How do we start to reverse that? Or do we? Or is it, I don't know, this is an interesting topic to navigate. And I feel like you, you like you said, you've kind of been in that ship for a lot longer than, than most people. So I don't know, do you have any kind of pieces of advice or, or tips for once you start to feel that invisibility encroach on you? Well, so this goes back to that thing I was talking about with social norms, right? Like, so to mm -hmm. say that you felt sexually viable or hot at a certain weight or body image mm -hmm. is so part of like what has been normalized as okay or hot mm -hmm. versus why wouldn't any part of your body be at any point just as valued and worthy as anything else? And it's so oversimplistic, right? Like I live in LA in Orange County. I get it. Like I get that okay. this is a thing. And so this is a funny thing as, as being asexual is that when I see somebody with um, six pack abs or like Michelle Yeoh, she has like these amazing biceps. Yeah. I'm just like, damn, because I know how hard it is to get that. 
Right. right? It's more of like, right. wow, that took work. That's dedication. That's like, that's right. focus. Not of like, ooh, let me touch that. It's more like. <laughs> <laughs> it's impressive, not attractive. It's impressive. Right. Yeah. But for other people, yeah. it's like, oh, I like appreciate <laughs> but in a different way um, I had so to I work on that this up. body come on I had to put in work Get all this all this fluffy you know <laughs> 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 no let me stop I'm kidding but, but I mean that's that's like but those are considered desired characteristics right so it's not a normal thing for the human body to do mm -hmm. so it's sort of fight yeah. against age to fight for that body takes a lot of um, perseverance. Yeah, Why I'm yeah. honoring that over anything else, I just know that that doesn't come easy, right? right so that's right. the reason I honor that. But for anybody else, where it's like, why are we honoring these things that are so impossible, if not hard to attain, unless you give up so much? That to me is now what's considered valuable or has commodity, and I like I don't. It's unachievable for most people. So why are we putting that on a pedestal? It doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when I watch movies. And especially around women, it's on the heteronormative front, it's like, they're always looking at dating. They're always about finding somebody and hooking up. And I'm like, bitch, you have more fucking value than that. And not even <laughs> thinking about the invisibility later, but like, what else are you cashing in on? And the mm. way that women are portrayed is like, there is nothing except to get your MRS or to, you know, to hook the guy right. at the end. I'm like, really? Like, really? Like and it's not even being... <laughs> yeah, but it's not about like me being feminist or anything. It's just, where is your fucking value as a human being? And how are we going to break past that when all of the media tells us something else? And I go like, when do we start thinking for ourselves? And I don't feel like mm. the world at large does. It's, I'm, oh, I'm supposed to. And mm -hmm. it's not a choice. It's just an assumption. And I, like, I'm tired of all of these assumptions. And then I seem like the weirdo to go, but why are you doing that? <laughs> oh, I like that. In fact, literally just today, um, let's see, there was a new book released by Robert Sapolsky um, okay. called Determined. And I myself mm -hmm. am a determinist. And what that basically means is that there is there's no free will. Sorry, guys. Like everything that happens, everything you do, I'm not going to say it's predetermined, but just that it it it's like whatever has happened was going to happen that way. Like your brain chemistry, your upbringing, the, the weather, your parenting, your biochemistry, everything culminates in you having a specific action. There are actual studies that have been done that show that if you were to, to choose which hand to raise before you actually consciously make that decision, your brain has already registered. I'm going to raise my right hand or left hand. So like there's, wow. there's just no, there's no such thing as free will. I think we can give people so much more compassion um, and empathy and knowing that you, you did, like you said, you didn't choose to be asexual. You, you know, nobody's choosing to fall into these societal pressures. I hate to say it, but like murderers, rapists, those people, like they, they're doing those things as a culmination of so many factors that were outside of their control. That if we can start to actually have empathy for those people, start to create some sort of mindset of rehabilitation as opposed to punishment. Yeah. If we can look at that for those extreme cases, then why can't we do that or start to do that for how men are, again, being misogynistic or women who fall into that trap of, oh, I, I need to get a, a man to, to feel satisfied or fulfilled in my life. Like, you know, again, you know, it's exactly what you're saying. Where did that come from? What are those variables and stimuli that created that thought in your brain in the first place? So I'm really excited to dig into his book, Sapolsky's book, about how we can change as a society. Not to go on such a huge segue, but I think for me, that's in, in our conversation so far, that's what's maybe giving me some hope in all of this. Like, you know, hey, you know, nobody can help anything. But once we do start to understand these patterns and these different variables, then, you know, once we pull the the top off of uh, Schrodinger's box, <laughs> you know, and start to see what exactly is happening with our minds and with our, our hormones and all these different things that play into our actions and our, our decisions and our choices, then I think that'll just start a paradigm shift in how we start to treat each other. So 
saying all that to say, <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I think that's the reason why. And I think that's mm. also why, you know, where where we might have some uh, actual viable change soon, if we can all start to just accept that, you know, nobody's consciously making these decisions to be an asshole or be a misogynist or be asexual or be homosexual right. or heterosexual or any of these things. Well, what I think also is really important is like the awareness of, of that is one aspect, right? So it's very cognitive. And like, mm -hmm. where do we have the skill sets around navigating change or discomfort so that we can actually mm -hmm. lean in and actually learn? And I mean, mm -hmm. from like an embodied experience, like even I'm doing my heart, but like, um, but it's not just in my head. And I'm seeing this person as a human, like, how do we create it so that change is not so uncomfortable that I want to flat out reject it, which I feel like mm -hmm. tends to be the norm. And, and so I hear right. you on that. Like, I do think it's part of understanding in the brain. And it's also about understanding as a full person. And I don't think that we teach and, you know, we're both you and I have both been in education, but like, I don't feel like we teach the kinds of skill sets that are needed for us to truly connect in ways that would um, supersede a lot of these things versus saying somebody always has to be wrong. I've always right, got to punish right. somebody. Somebody's going to be on the out because humans are all, all about hi hierarchy. I've got to go right. up higher this way. And that means this person has to be put aside or, or demonized. Like we haven't figured out how to have more complexity on a cognitive level and definitely not on a heart human soul level to see people mm -hmm. as people. And I don't know what it would take to do, but I know that um, in my mind, the the awareness is first and then the actions and the listening and the doing has to follow because it's mm -hmm. not just enough to know um mm -hmm. and i think you and i've had conversations around this but it's one thing to be you know why i said earlier i get in trouble all the time like if i'm seeing something i'll name it because i think if you speak it into the space now we can address it but right. other people won't even when they feel the same thing and then privately after like oh my gosh thank you so much for saying that why didn't you right. say it? Right. right. But it's I around safety. I my back when I was saying it. Right. Right. But it's safety. Like, okay, I'm still not demonized. That person can be the spokesperson. I don't have to take on the responsibility. But to me, like, that to, is a, an issue that I feel like it's having. So as an asexual, if I'm out, like, I don't have to be out. Like, I can just look like a chaste person, which I think in a lot of religious circles would be considered good, right? I'm not having sex out of marriage. And as an educator, I'm living a very, like prim and proper life in that sense right and but it's still not it's still betraying what is true for me so why don't i just own that and it does make people uncomfortable so i realize that i can pretend and have these fake relationships that are really not substantive or i can be owning my truth and see who's actually going to stay and not so oh, so that's yeah. something that i've learned along the way as much as it hurts to feel like um, i don't have enough people who get me at least it's real and this other stuff that I feel that we can lie to ourselves about, like I have all of these friends or followers and social media. I'm like, who, are they going to be there when you show up as 100% you versus these things that we put up to make ourselves likable? Mm. I don't know. Mm. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So, okay. <laughs> like, I feel like we're, we're digging in, you know, like that's, that's, yeah. that's, because all this kind of goes to the heart of so much more than asexuality or sex. But like I, I think so so much of this goes into societal views and 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 history and the zero sum game of you know if you're winning I'm losing you know versus us realizing we all have the same interests at heart at the mm -hmm. long run we all want genuine connection maybe fewer very real interactions and relationships than than the the superfluous when it comes to then us maybe taking it back to how society generally views asexuality. What are what are some of those challenges and stigmas that you see from your lens? Like when you do come out, how have people been affected by you telling them your truth? And also, are there things that you have found helpful in challenging the preconceptions that people seem to have around uh you and or asexuality when you do open yourself up to them about who you are yeah there's so much to that so like um i know so it's been so interesting um if, so if i've come out and said i'm ace or i'm not going to be in a relationship people are like oh she must be repressing that she's gay and doesn't want to come out and so this is a oh, safe way of doing it like all these assumptions around no i just told you what i fucking am don't <laughs> 
you're not aware. I'm fucking aware. Fuck off. You know, like that like, kind I think of I thing. I would know again, right? You asked me, I told you. <laughs> but no, and then don't go okay, and tell exactly. somebody else that. Tell me to my face so I can go mm-hmm. fuck off. You know, like, no, that is not what I said. But then, <laughs> but then in the queer community, um, mm-hmm. that I'm considered an affront by some people. Really? Right. So like me as an ace, that means I'm anti-sex and the queer community oh. is all pro-sex and having things that are, um, you know, um, against the heteronormative structure. So I am somehow um, not necessarily accepted, which is why I think sometimes um, aces get erased. Right. Because oh, it's like the perception is if we don't have sex, we must be anti it, which some people are. Right. That's their choice. But to me, I'm like, I'm still fringe. I'm still marginalized. I'm still not part of the heteronormative culture. So I am part of this. But it's not necessarily always seen that way. So that to me is also interesting about even within these communities that are to be inclusive, there's still this header, this hierarchy of like who gets to be top billing and who needs to be pushed down because maybe they don't understand it or it creates something that they have to work on within themselves that doesn't feel mm. good. Mm. Right. So then, so that to me is like, okay, what's that about? Um, yeah. And that, that's really disappointing. Um, but then the other thing around representation, like in the media, there are more asexuals that are being represented, but whether explicit or not, most of them are made to be weird, like socially awkward. Right, or autistic, or, right, right, or OCD, right, so, or, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You're and so and, right. so, and then they're, and they're mainly white men, right? So it's mm-hmm. almost like, the, and it's in comedy. So the comedy is around like a cis white hetero male can like not be sexually motivated. And that's funny, you know, like. Right. That's a thing. But then they're also so bizarre. So it's another way of like representation showing like, let's perpetuate this thing about them being weird or wrong or broken, yeah. but we can laugh at them. That to me is not inclusive. That isn't representation. It's putting forth a way that people are further not understanding because they think it's being represented accurately when it's not. Mm. That to me wow. is a problem. But, you know, we, we could talk about that in representation in terms of race, in terms of gender. Like, there's so many ways we could talk about it. But to me, that's, you know, why we always talk about, like, if you're going to have a writer in a, in a creative space in the room, have them be the true people that can't fully represent all of it, but at least have more of a lens of, like, the lived experience of it. And I don't feel like that is happening at large. So that, mm-hmm. to me, is a problem of how often are we going to, or how much longer are we going to perpetuate these negative um not even stereotypes, but negative uh, portrayals of people that are meant to be mocked and right. looked down upon rather than show their humanity, which still can be funny because people can be funny because we just are. And it has mm-hmm. nothing to do with the labels that we want to put on them to make them different or wrong. It's just mm-hmm. what I don't know. It could be super simple. I don't want fucking socks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get you socks, Pamela. I'm not going to get you anything. No, Pamela. but I mean, like, it's so no, dumb, right? Gotcha. But I mean, it can be that simple. It's like, it's super funny where you're like, it's like, I love you, but I don't, I don't wear socks. I mean, I do, but like, I don't want soft socks. You know, But I'd so keep funny. them and I would pet them and be like, oh, yeah, Sophie. But goes, That's not how you use socks. <laughs> but you know what? Like, I wouldn't care. Like, I feel like, and, and not to like take the side of people who are like, I'm going to get you something anyway or anything like that. But I think the mentality for me anyway is very selfish. It's very much like, oh, it makes me feel so good to know that I am, you know, helping you through a difficult time or, or helping to show that how much I love you or whatever the case is. Like, so, you know, I, I recognize the selfishness in it and I'm like, oh, well, let me not be selfish, and, you know, and honor who you, who you are and what you want. And so like, you know, I, but I get how that might be difficult for some people to, to admit, you know they're being selfish or that, you know, cause again, that seems that's deemed so negative that, you know, nobody mm. wants to be sex uh, selfish. Nobody wants to be narcissistic. Nobody wants to be racist. Nobody wants to admit that they are all these things or offensive or whatever when they so clearly are, you know, so just to take it down to, you know, admitting that, you know, you're doing something more, not more for you, but in addition to for you than also for the other person. You know, I think that's just difficult for for a lot of people to to accept, and, and you know, and that's okay. Um, but again, I I thank you for <laughs> letting me know. Like, it's not to waste my money on things that won't serve <laughs> won't serve you. You know, so so I appreciate it. 
But um, well, I appreciate you know. for for getting it. Like, right? Like, I don't think, like you said, most people won't. But it's like impact over intention. Like, you care about impact. Oh, yeah. Right? People yeah. say they do, but it's like the intention is enough for me to go. Like, well, you like not you, but like I did this for you, so you should be appreciative. And it's like I didn't want it, so your impact sucked ass. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, but that isn't isn't necessarily how I'm going to say it, but like, to me, that is so not understood at large because the acceptance is, but I did you a good thing and I meant to do mm. well, like, but your intention, especially when we talk about race, it didn't, it, it landed awful. So mm-hmm. why can't we at, like put that to all aspects of life? Like we can have good yeah. intentions, but if they don't land, then you're further isolating me. You're making me go like, it's okay. Like even like with pronouns, it's like, Oh, I'm sorry. I called you whatever. It's like, sorry, you're making the person assure you that it's okay for their mistake. Like we have those skill sets that I talked about. Like if we're really caring about impact, it's not about apologizing. It's about getting it right. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have to, I don't need to um, affirm you for a choice you made that negatively impacted me because you feel bad. Like that to me is the other weird thing about somebody who steps outside the norm to go like, Hey, let me call this out. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. And then they cry. It's like, Oh, now I'm comforting that bitch. (laughs) Right. Oh my God. Okay. As a black woman. Absolutely. That is absolutely my lived experience. I would say like, like we have to be the educators to other races, other sexes, you know, about Mm -hmm. everything. I feel like we've been given permission as of late. Like, oh, there's so much new therapeutic conversations and societal conversations and DEI conversations that I think help us to not <laughs> have to feel like that. Like, I, I've, I've solidly turned off my teacher hat. Like, like I've had friends I've just cut off because I'm tired of being like, no, you can't say nigger because this or you know, you know, mm-hmm. you know, no, all black people aren't you know fighting each other. It's just. You know, when you, you redline people into urban cities and this and that, this is just what happens. Or crime is white on white crime is just as much as black on black. You know, like I'm tired of it. I'm so tired of it. So, so I feel like as of late, we've all been kind of, or black people anyway, have been given permission to be like, no, that's not my job. I don't have to do it. If you really cared enough, you would take a minute and research this for yourself. But I don't know that that's true for. Uh, gay people or, or ace people or people with disabilities or other people, you know, you know, fringed others, like you said, who, who still have to have that onus of, let me explain mm-hmm. one more time. It, it's not that I'm anti-sex. It's that I just, it's not in my radar. <laughs> I don't, I don't hope that you have so many more interactions that you get to a place where you don't have to be the teacher. Um but maybe that's what this is. Maybe that's that's why we're here. Is so hopefully, you know, if if we can grow this audience enough, there'll be enough people to have that understanding going into it. So it's not like okay, I have to put on my scholarly cap and and have this conversation before you can start to in, in, engage with me and understand who I am. We can just start from a place of I'm Pamela and this is who I am. Um, mm-hmm. So thank you for <laughs> being here to. To do that, I think also to, to regress a little in your own advancement of your advocacy work with this or your educational work around asexuality, because um, I, I can't imagine it's easy for you to have to answer the same fucking questions over and over and over. Thank you for, for doing that with us today. It's brilliant. I really appreciate it. <laughs> well, I, I would say that if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have this conversation because I feel like mm-hmm. the whole space that you hold and the curiosity that you have and the want that you have in the world to just do and just lift us up as a humanity. Of course, I'm here for that. For others, mm-hmm. it would be much more, it feels more clinical. Like, I think you mm-hmm. care about me as a person, you care about people in general. And so for me, that is the reason that I'm here. But to your point, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not happy about having to wear the educator hat, but I didn't feel like that at all in talking with you. I felt like it was mm-hmm. really about learning, it's understanding, it's elevating, it feels really, um, I don't know, it feels rare and it feels super, like, fulfilling. Oh, thank you. That's what I mean, you know, and can I, can I douse the fire on that real quick? <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. Sure. <laughs> cause that, cause it's something that, um, I imagine that if you were to ask like a gay person, like if you, 
if you could take a magic pill and not be gay, would you take it? Like, that's a, that's a tough thing. So I'm curious, like, if you could take a magic pill and not be asexual or, or increase libido or whatever it is that is, you know, putting you in this orientation, would you take it? On days where I feel really, um, I don't know, persecuted, I would say, mm-hmm. yeah. Because sometimes mm-hmm. it just hurts too fucking much to just live in the constant blatant rejection mm-hmm. um, and ostracization. Um, in general, I mean, then it would be a different life. I would be living a very much more ignorant view of like what things are and what they aren't, um, which has its own sense of bliss, like the matrix. I'm, I'm in, oh, wow. Wow. I'm seeing, I'm seeing stuff that I don't want to see, but hey, I'm in it. Uh, but I did want to say that one thing around libido that you had mentioned, mm-hmm. um, so that, that framing of it, like, like if I could get my libido back, like it was never there. Uh-huh. Right. So this, again, this assumption around like we all have some like sexual desire. It's like not for everybody. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, what, you know, if you and could magically create a libido, would that be something that would interest you? I don't know what I'd use it for. <laughs> oh, I love like, it. Wait, what? Like, oh, I'm just going to be like fucking all these people? Like, ew. I don't know. It just sounds. No. Like, no. <laughs> I love it. And, you know, okay. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. And, and it's funny because, like, I'm, I use the example of, like, you know, you could be gay, but. You know, when I was a younger person um, and I would get that, you know, oh, you're not like other black people. You know, I don't even see you as black. You know, there mm. was a time when I I used to be like, oh, thank goodness. You know, there was a clear distinction between niggers and black people, according to Chris mm-hmm. Rock and comedians in society. You know, like, so, you know, I don't, I, you know, it almost was like, wow, you know, I don't know. I'd say in my early teens even younger you know if if i were to take a pill that would make me white i would have i probably would have considered that so it's interesting you know to now kind of think about that question for myself like if i were to change a fundamental part of who i am um no of course today no of course i wouldn't but you know but i i have had that thought you know that that has inhabited me (laughs) so Mm -hmm. it's interesting that you know um i've never been white um you know but yet, but yet that was a, a temptation um, in my early uh, life. Um, but for you, you, you've never had a libido and yet you're still like, no, don't need it. Don't want it. What do I do with it? So that's, that's really interesting that, um, I don't know, we can, we can both be marginalized in a way and still see the escape from that um, as, as maybe two different things. Mm-hmm. Hmm. yeah it's hard <laughs> it's hard though it's like what are we told is yeah. beautiful or right or mm. the the thing to to covet and and so to be not that of course mm. i think part of us who owning who we are is going to be about how am i in relation to that and what do i do with what i have right so some people mm. might do a lot of plastic surgery or you know skin mm. lightening for example get rid of the mel- melanin and and to like start living to those norms and it's like but that's for acceptance and again something that's been deemed by who and then agreed upon by whom and like mm-hmm. what what like what are we doing again <laughs> right like and why why yeah and we did it but we do time? like really mm-hmm. yeah it's like that um that lady who was going to her mom's house for Thanksgiving and her mom cut the legs off the turkey before putting it in the pan. And she's like, you know, I, I cut my legs off the turkey before I put it in the pan. Why do you do that, mom? She's like, I don't know. My mom did it. So let, let me ask my mom. So they call the grandma. And they're like, grandma, why did you cut the legs off the turkey before putting it in the oven? Um, you know, did it make the flavor better? Was it cooking more evenly? And, and you know, like it's something we've been doing our whole lives. Um, oh, no, I didn't have a pan that was big enough. <laughs> so I had to cut the turkey. Legs. So like, so, so I don't know. I feel like we can do that. We can, we can generationally 
you know, mm-hmm. um, go through life just believing this is the way. Uh, mm-hmm. This is the way. <laughs> when in reality, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> but when in reality, it's like that stems from necessity at the time or, or convention at the time or, you know, what somebody else interjected or, or um, injected into the culture at the time. And so, I don't know. That's just interesting how mm-hmm. uh, there's so many parallels across so many cultural aspects of the both of us. That's so cool. But yeah, <laughs> for sure. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. I, I, I feel like my other thought around the in- intersectionality is that again, as an Asian woman, <laughs> there are these stereotypes though of the, mm-hmm. the tiger mom being fetishized. It's weird because either Asian women are seen as really meek and oh, I do whatever, you know, or, or they're like a hard ass. Do you feel like the way that you present, especially with your asexuality, does it counter those stereotypes? Does it play into those stereotypes? Do you feel like people view you first as those stereotypes and then they get past that to then grapple with your sexuality? Or how does that intersectionality present for you? Right. Well, so I think a lot of asexuals are considered cold because that means that, mm-hmm. oh, you don't want relationship, right? So I think it plays into the more dragon lady, tiger mom type of thing mm-hmm. where um, I must be a hard ass. I must be someone that's like going to give no fucks kind of thing, which I mean, I kind of do. So I guess I am a stereotype <laughs> in that way. Uh, that's the name of but, your actual show, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so so I think that doesn't help right and so when i did that those interviews with some folks around why was i not someone they would ever consider i was like you're gonna you're gonna fuck me up like i think that was the actual phrase i remember someone specifically saying i'm like physically and i'm like well yeah that too but no like you would decimate <laughs> me emotionally because i wouldn't put up with shit oh, wow. like why are you doing that right and it's not about like having a fight it was just more of let's be really present and to your point mm-hmm. around like the turkey legs why are we doing this and it's not to always ha- come with like negative energy. It's just more of wait, what's happening? And I don't know yeah. that everyone wants to be that all the time because it's a lot of energy. But to me, it's like why I tend to be much more, um, I don't know the words choosy, but like where I put my energy is much more focused. So where people mm-hmm. are like taking in a lot of information at large, like I don't do all of that because it's just too much with, it's like too much breath and not enough depth. And I want mm-hmm. depth and I don't think that's what everybody's looking for. So, so for me, it's this, like, let's, let's be real in this moment and let's be here with one another versus, Hey, I'm going to be on my phone or I'm like, I'm checking out that person. You know, it's like, we, we got, we become so distracted. I just want to be like really in the now. And so there's yeah. so many ways that I feel like I have become more of an anomaly at large because of my intersectionality. But also if I'm considered cold or a dragon lady, and I remember one of my friends said, well, your statement glasses clearly make you not model minority. I'm like, I didn't know these were statement what? glasses. I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's like a lot to unpack that sentence. Like, really? What? Yeah. Like your statement glasses don't make you model minority. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, so a uh, model minority would be very demure and unassuming, right? So I'm not going to take up space. These glasses are saying like, look at me. I don't think that's it's what a, they're for, but I mean, that's how no, it can be perceived. But that's, right? but that's and, what that person came at you with? Like, that's just such a weird, that's weird to me. That's weird. That's oh, weird. it's so funny because it was done in support of me to go like, <laughs> I, I was, I was talking, <laughs> I was talking about how I showed up and was being me, which was being direct and saying all of this stuff. And it just wasn't heard. And after some time, finally, these folks were just realizing, oh, all not consciously, but to me, in my mind, all these stereotypes they had about me being this Asian woman who's just going to sign off on stuff because I'm model minority was fucking blown out of the water for them. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, mm-hmm. so my friend was saying, just looking at you, you clearly are not model. Mi- There's nothing about you that presents model minority. So that's on them. That's their racism. That's their stereotype. There's oh, their, that's gotcha. their shit. But then gotcha. you then got demonized for it because you didn't play into what they wanted you to be. So mm-hmm. that was why she said that. And and so those are things where, again, all of the stuff that runs unconsciously for us that drives us and even their behaviors don't make any sense to me now. Mm-hmm. My friend was trying to help me unpack like why they had such a strong negative reaction to me was I can't help that they had those ways of perceiving me no matter what uh-huh. evidence they got otherwise. 
but in the end who got punished because they all agreed against me i was like what do i do with that and so it's all i can do is show up as me and like i said find out who i want to be with but i'm not going to have these conversations with people that one can't listen but also spend Mm -hmm. more time with folks that are unwilling to see where they also have their own blind spots which i know i have them too but i'm willing to like look at them and go wait what did i do where did i overstep Mm -hmm. And it's about correcting it so that I can be better. But I would hope we all would do this. And right. I, maybe my lived experience has like made me more prone to that because I've been so misunderstood for so much of my life. But I'm like, I would want that for everyone because I think everyone is misunderstood. They're just not willing to look because it hurts too fucking much. Wow. Wow. I think you're absolutely right. Wow. And you know, and I, I love that because, um, Again, my lens is a black woman. So like even just the woman aspect, like I've been in those rooms where um, I'll say something, uh, a white man might say the exact same thing. And then Mm -hmm. that's when it's a good idea. Then that's when it's heard, you know? So I I know exactly what you mean. Um, But yeah, to to, uh, experience that from that dragon lady lens or that the the model minority lens, I I definitely understand what they meant a little bit better. So thank you for for clarifying but wow thank you for asking <laughs> no thank sure, you for sure. asking more absolutely absolutely well, yeah I mean, I, and then the, yeah, the one yeah. last thing is around like being a woman though like i know mm. i'm female presenting but i've never felt like a woman because of the asexuality because to me mm. womanhood is to me conflated with having sexual viability so i've always mm. called myself um maybe a more recently like age under female but i said i'm female because mm-hmm. to me, it's more about biology. It's not about the mm-hmm. the thing that gets engendered to me with being a woman. Gotcha. Which is why I also Your go by she, female. they. Yeah. Yeah. So the sex is female. But like, so that's why I do she, they. Because it's not that I'm fully non-binary because I know I'm female presenting. But I'm mm-hmm. also not feeling like a female that has any cachet in that sense. I might as well not have a gender because nobody's seeing me in that sense at all. And that's if mm-hmm. I cared about sex. But so, so to me, that whole thing around gender gets very confusing because to me, it's also conflated with um, sexuality. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And I guess it's... At least from... At least I, from no, 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 I get it. I was wondering why they included a gender as one of the A's or as one of, what one of the A's could be uh, because mm-hmm. I, I didn't understand that until you just said that. Um, well, I don't know if that's for that all. Question. That's for for me. That that's how I yeah. take it. But I don't know how every how how at large. I wish I did. But um, no, so I, you know, I, like a gender versus non binary. Like, what is the reason? I don't need to yeah. know intellectually. But there's there's ways that people are identifying that are specific to that. And for whatever reason, mm-hmm. for me, a gender made more sense. Which is, but it's a gender female, not just a gender entirely. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're still technically so. cis in a way, I guess. Right. So that, right. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. But no, I. I didn't understand where age, because again, I, in my head, I saw a gender and immediately thought non-binary. So that, mm. that really made it make more sense. Um, mm. Interesting. Interesting. So, and, and you actually shared some really great uh, resources with me. I read that uh, time article that, that really opened my eyes a lot about um, how asexual people before they understand what their orientation is, they try, they experiment, they, they have sex, they, you know, they, they try to have relationships because of that, you know, normativity. And so that was, that was really hard for me (laughs) that, you know, that you have to put yourself in these positions that are so uncomfortable. And sometimes I'd even say dangerous because of our desire for societal connection, perhaps, or just the fact that, you know, again, that's what we're taught. That's, that's the norm. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I really, I will definitely share that time piece, but are there other resources that you would recommend that people who might be feeling that they are resonating with this label or are there support groups or networks that were helpful for you or what's out there for people in your situation who might not know they're in your situation? So asexuality.org, it's the AVEN, um, it's asexuality equity network. But they are, they have like the, the largest wealth of resources and information and supports that I've seen. Um, and the, um, the founder of it did a really great TED talk, um, uh, mm-hmm. specifically talking mm-hmm. around connection, which I think is super important. And I love that he is so visible in, and being very clear about that. Um, there is this thing called aceweek.org, 
which is a week of the year where folks can it's um, now. come together. And- it starts today. Oh, oh yeah, it is October. Yeah. I was thinking about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, it is now. And and so and like in different parts of, of uh, specifically the U.S., they have events that are happening so that people yeah. can go and attend in person. The Trevor Project to me in general is such a great resource. So they have some oh, really? uh, some stuff in there as well. Yeah. And I just feel like okay. those are the ones on top of the Time article that I feel like really kind of unpacks the, the more human heartfelt experience of, of what it goes yeah. through. But all of those to me are just a ways to be an advocate and ally, but just to, to learn and realize where we have our own beliefs that we didn't even realize are so entrenched that we just assume them to be true. So I don't mm. think people go out of their way, have gone out of their way to make me feel bad. It's like, no, that's not normal. I always seek these groups that are trying to like transcend humanity. And mm. one of them was like, I want to talk about feminine, masculine energy. And she's very sexual. So I said, is this going to be about finding a man? Because it's very also very heteronormative, um, mm-hmm. or is this around actual the energy of it? And she's like, sexuality is normal, and finding a man is normal. And so that was my answer, which was super disappointing because she wow. does some really great work about like unpacking our own awareness and impact. But for her, sex is so driving it; she could never see me wow. outside of being just weird, and did not want to oh. work with me. It seemed like because, again, I'm considered an affront to her wanting to be like. I'm hot. Let me get a man. And I'm like, mm. and, I'm, and all inside, I was like, bitch, it's not all you have. <laughs> right. right. But like, oh. but it's, that's, so that, that to me is the, the disappointment of even people that are doing a lot of self-awareness and a lot of work are still finding sex to be such a, a main force of who they are, which is their identity mm-hmm. that they mm-hmm. can't even consider somebody else not having that same identity. So they must be wrong. Wow. So I don't think it, again, it was intentional. It was just, no, that's not a thing. You are not a right. thing. You're an anomaly. You know, like, go get your whatever checked and get that fixed mm. versus, mm. hey, this is where you're coming from. How do I meet you or come along with you here? Like, that is not a conversation at large for anybody, mm-hmm. I feel like. Um, you are, of course, but I mean, it's a rare, <laughs> but I mean, seriously, it's a yeah. rare thing to find somebody who is willing to sit there and go, wait, I don't get it can I push on you a little? I know you, you and I've said that before. Can I push on you? It's like, yeah, please. Yeah. Right. Cause this is where we get past the barrier of like, what is the holdup or the misunderstanding versus like, okay, she's being whatever. It's like, yeah. help me get you not just here, but like in your heart, like it's not oh. just in the head. So yeah. I appreciate you for being that. And we need more oh. Sophie's in the world, honestly. Oh my gosh. You're so sweet. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. But no, I, I, I hope that, I hope that this helps. I do. I hope that, you know, other people, maybe if that's what they take from this is, you know, just don't, don't take things at face value. Take a second, ask questions, be curious, be kind, you know, be, be empathetic. If you don't understand something, don't use your misunderstanding as an excuse to lash out or to act like the, that you're the victim for not having mm. a, a piece of knowledge um, and understand how, how that can actually be traumatic for the other person. Because it's like you were saying, like when, when, when you say, Hey, you were in the wrong on this. And then immediately you're met with tears or, or, Oh, I didn't mean to, or I'm so sorry. You know, like immediately that takes the onus of, of having to, maintain that curiosity off of that person and now you have to like you said be that healer be that supporter so i I think if again if people just accept that they can be wrong that they don't know everything Mm -hmm. that there's more information out here than we'll ever all be able to possess (laughs) like there are things you don't you just don't even know you don't know um yep let's 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 just accept that let's accept that and then we can, I think, move forward with, with so much more empathy and understanding. Um, so I appreciate and that. Ki- um, yeah, sure. Can I say one thing in, in terms of your comment on that is that um, the curiosity really being about letting go of our own biases or what we seem to be true. So if I'm right. coming, if someone's like, how are you asexual? What do you mean? You don't do this, this and this. And it's like, wait, you don't what? what you don't this and it's like they're clearly putting their judgments all into the space that's not curious to me right. in a way that is supportive it's almost like a bit versus an actual like 
that all may be going on, but let me really try to get this person. It's just like, it feels like a constant questioning and like invalidation versus a true Mm. listening. And I think like, if so when I, when people say be curious, sometimes the, the, it's a move toward, right. But it's still not Mm. quite there to still have these judgments put in. It's like, yes, you do. Oh no, come on. Yeah, you do. You can tell me. Wow. It's wow. still being curious, but not in the sense that I know you can be, which is just fully open and go like, no, please help me understand. Just like you said with the glasses and the model minority, like, please help me unpack that. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. that to me is, it wasn't met with anything outside of slow down a second versus this, <laughs> wait, what, what, okay. you know, and that, gotcha. that drives me almost even more nuts. <laughs> and <laughs> I get so frustrated. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, I just want to punch everybody. Like, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, wow. I mean, so, okay. You know, I, I definitely see myself as an, as an ally, definitely to you, but I think also to, if I met another person who said, you know, I'm asexual, I'm ace, I'm arrow, I'd immediately be like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> you know? I know what that means. I know, I feel like I already know you better without even knowing you because of Mm -hmm. this knowledge that you have imparted upon me. So thank you. But as an ally, how can I better contribute to this becoming a more inclusive environment or space? What more can I be doing to help people who, again, are, are solidly knowledgeable of their orientation or curious about their orientation? Oh, wow. Um, I think sometimes correcting others, and I don't mean that in a bad way, just like if somebody is saying something that is clearly anti-ace, for example, the ace person doesn't have to be there. Your allyship is still making sure that other people are learning. So it's not always the person that has to like say it for everyone. And Mm -hmm. I don't mean like, uh, I feel like that's something hard to just constantly take on to have to be the one doing it. So if you're seeing someone else doing something that is destructive, help right like wow. correct it make make it right like i think that would be helpful you haven't done this but i think it's really funny when somebody goes like oh i know someone else's ace you guys should be friends like, <laughs> right 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 mm, there's a missing there right Good and one. and so earlier on in my ace life i was thinking like well i don't care about sex so why would i want to talk to someone who also doesn't care about sex like people don't get along because they don't care about the same thing They care, they get along usually for different reasons, but it could be they hate the same thing or they love the same thing, right? But like, if you don't care, it's like, what? But I know now that I better understand it's an identity and all of the ways that we've had to navigate that, like it makes more sense. But early on it was, that's dumb. But I mean, we hear it all the time. Like, I have a black friend. Oh, you guys should be friends. It's like, so it's so. You must know this person because. Right, right. You must know this or um, that just that it's like just the top of awareness where they're getting there, which is why earlier I was saying that's one thing, but there has to be more depth to it than that and seeing the person beyond this label or identity. And I feel like that's sometimes what we forget. So you and I talk Mm -hmm. about intersectionality, which is so much more, but even like Mm -hmm. a singular identity sometimes gets missed. And people's good intentions, again, are, it's a lack of understanding and a lack of getting it that, um, that to your point, they need to realize that they don't know everything and they have to be maybe wrong to really be in a true ally and in support of somebody who is at large, really not understood or people don't even realize what they're putting on folks that are marginalized. Mm, mm, mm. That's beautiful. Well, I gotta say, this conversation has just been so impactful to me. I feel like we know each other pretty well. And yet, in the last, what, hour and some change, like, I have learned so much more about you that has, in some ways, solidified things I've already felt for you, but in some ways, I've also, I think, upended things that I had been holding around your space that I didn't even realize I was. So, so thank you for setting me straight. Thank you. Especially around like the libido thing and around even like your past relationship and things like that. I, I really appreciate your vulnerability, your openness uh, in talking about things that, again, I, I know aren't easy. I know you're very private. I know this is maybe not what you would have chosen to do off gate, you know, if I hadn't prompted it. So so thanks for accepting the prompt. But if if you were to now 
after kind of unpacking all these things, talked to little Pamela <laughs> at like five, six, seven, eight years old, or even like as you were starting to come into puberty and into this awareness that, okay, things aren't really gelling for me like they seem to for others. Like, what, what would you say to that little girl? Mm. Um, it sounds so cliche, but like you're perfect as you are in your imperfection, right? It's like, just stay the course and honor yourself. Who are you living your life for? It's for you, not for anyone else. Great. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say that for anybody. I'd say that to me today. Right? Like, I need that every moment going like, why am I doing this again? It's like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be ostracized again. So I'm just going to suck it up. It's like, but why? That's a good point. That's a good point. If that's, that's timeless advice. That's timeless mm -hmm. advice and beautiful advice. Thank you. Um, well, now I, <laughs> we're coming to the part of the show <laughs> where I'm going to ask you a question. I ask all my guests and you certainly are free to not have an answer to it. But mm -hmm. what is the last thing you masturbated to? <laughs> I don't think it's to anything, but also like it's so rare that I um, that I call it super bait, like the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay what's the right? last so it's like, super bait into I freaking love that <laughs> so, I mean, so, no, I mean, so, I mean, like, so it's an event right it's like Rihanna and like you know confetti and like lots of noise and <laughs> dancing <laughs> it's like oh it's god. not a, a not a firework <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and like people who do it regularly I imagine it takes a lot of minutes out of many days and I get so much more done with y'all doing that and chasing stuff because it's like none of that's on my radar <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um, so, so what what's in your head when you're super baiting? Like is that a thing? Or is it just No, I think it, if I think if I do it it's just probably physical release. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's so cool. Well, I mm -hmm. didn't expect that. <laughs> I thought you'd be like what the fuck are you talking about, Sophie? I don't even know. So that's but see I like that though because that's I don't know. I feel like that couches you we like we talk about humanity a lot and mm -hmm. and we you know you and i we kind of talked about biology a lot and so i i like that sometimes like you just do what you gotta do Simple yeah like i have okay. a i mean you know i have a cockatoo and like yeah. even earlier this morning chili. he was just like yeah chili so he was just like we're just cuddling and then all of a sudden he tried to hunt my hand and i'm like oh come <laughs> on dude but like it's just okay I mean, first he, of all you guys he, but if you ever seen that video or the the cockatoo, yeah. Oh God, it's yeah. just you know doing its little thing on this other cockatoo. And oh, I it's a conure. I think it's a conure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but I sent that to Pamela. Like, oh, this is so funny. They're dancing. She's like, oh, uh, they're humping. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. <laughs> like so that's of all people was. to send it to. <laughs> I was like, of all people to send it to. I'm like. Sophie, why? It's like, oh, I didn't know. And I was like, clearly. I I mean, <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that was so funny. So, so Chili, no, Chili was, didn't was... get that far. No, it didn't even get that far. It was just like the mounting, and then I was like, all right. And he's like, sit on my hand. I just like blew him off my hand. But um, but that bird was grinding. Like that was yeah. different. That was further in. <laughs> Again, by bi it's biological. It's biology. So I, I appreciate that, but. Honest to, honest to God, this has been such an impactful conversation to me. I really appreciate you taking the time and the energy and the love, if you don't mind. Um, tell us any final thoughts or comments that are swirling around and, and maybe we can wrap with how to keep in touch with you as well. But any final thoughts? Um, I would say everybody just check yourself, your assumptions, your impact, what you're doing, and like, take a moment to take responsibility, right? Like, I say that for myself, too. It, it would mean a lot to the world if we took more responsibility and agency about what we have an impact on than we currently do and stop dismissing it. Just be more present, be mindful. It, it's not just about asexuality, it's anything and how we connect with another person. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love it. Go ahead and plug your pluggables for us. <laughs> so to Sophie's point, I'm um, very private. So 
I could give you my Instagram handle, but if I don't know you, I will not accept your <laughs> friend request or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, yet, if you see me perform live, I'm um, very honest. I'm very authentic. My show that I've been doing this past year, which is called No Fucks Given, None Taken, All Done. And at first it was about asexuality and all it's not, which means no fucks, right? But then there's more than that. So what is my life beyond giving no fucks, literally and figuratively? <laughs> right. Love it, love it. Well, that, this, again, has been so wonderful. I, I really appreciate you just on so many levels. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. Thank you oh, so much. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. Well, with that, um, I will close, as I always do, with my directive to you, viewer or listener. <laughs> my dog starts barking as soon as I say it. Yes, well, that but, was, um, we needed an add-in. We needed some dog did. energy. Thank you. One of the three. They, they're crazy. But anyway, everybody, love one another with permission. 